Hello. I hope everyone is doing well today. I, again, I'm sorry that today's session is recorded for you instead of it being live. However, it's going to be just as effective as we move through our writing workshop. So today is um, our session four. You've made it through our first week. And so far you've identified the why, the purpose for why we write, why it's important. Um, the writing process as a whole. You chose a topic that was interesting to you. You developed questions to help guide your reading and to become an active reader so that you're learning more information. You summarized what you read and you communicated about it. And then you created yesterday an outline using all of the different questions that you've established throughout your reading and your research. So the next step in our writing process is actually drafting our first, our first rough copy, our first draft from that outline. So today we're going to be focusing on what do we actually write, the words, sentences, paragraphs, and more. So that's our goal for today. Uh, this is how we're going to do it. So here's our agenda. We are going to talk about how we're going to use our questions-driven draft into an outline. We are going to go over the paragraph structure. So how do we actually construct a paragraph? And the method I like to use is the called claim, evidence, warrant, extension. We're going to get into this more, you know, with more detail later because other teachers have different ideas about it. But that's how we're going to review the parts of a paragraph. We are going to practice some close reading so that you can see how to use evidence to develop claims. So this is important not to reverse those, and we're going to talk about that later. And then we're going to get through the writing process, okay? So we just write, 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 okay? Turning those questions into paragraphs now. We have to respond to those paragraphs. And the last thing is your homework um, for tonight and, and do on Monday. This doesn't apply to us today. All right, so kind of reviewed everything here. You should have with you an outline that is guided by 10 different questions. And the questions, again, were developed from your sources and your sources were selected by your topic, right? Your topic was chosen by you because you found it interesting or important about, you know, to learn. So you created this like kind of very connected interweb of ideas and questions and sources that all connect back to that topic or question that you sought out to answer. So each part of the process you'll notice builds upon the next step. It's all connected. It's, everything is, is connected together. And that's exactly what an essay really is. It's each part builds on the next and it's all connected. Okay, so now we need to answer each question that we put on our outline um, with a paragraph. And we broke a big question into 10 mini questions. So again, we're taking that big task of writing an essay and we're just breaking it into mini steps so it's more manageable for us. So paragraph structure, quick, a quick note on that. Teachers like to use all different um, acronyms or graphic organizers and just like words that help students put together a solid paragraph, but all a paragraph really needs is the different components to answer a question completely, right? We want to make sure that it has everything in there that is really supporting the answer to the question. So kind of think about your paragraphs um, as if it's a, a formula for a math question. You need to plug in the information in the correct place and then use almost like an order of operations to make sure everything works out in the end. It's the same principle for paragraphs. It's just a little bit different because we're working with words and not numbers. So to meet that fully respond requirement that teachers love to say, right? You didn't fully respond to the task or you didn't fully support your idea. This is why we have to make sure it has all the parts. And the parts are claim, evidence, warrant, and extension. So as you um, take more difficult courses throughout school, you might find that um, a claim that you make is really detailed and might actually require multiple pieces of evidence as support. So what you would then need to do is repeat the evidence and warrant steps. So you'll see it's just a, par a pattern. 
So anytime a teacher says, well, I want this paragraph to have two sources, or maybe you need to use these two, this novel and this article in your, in your response. And you're going to need to quote from both of them. You're going to need to cite two sources in one paragraph. All you would do in that case is just extend the evidence and warrant part. So you would say claim evidence warrant, evidence warrant extension. I know that these words right now are just words, but we're going to get into what they actually mean in the next slide. So again, there are many different approaches to writing paragraphs, and I'm just showing you this one. And after a decade of teaching English, um, I found that this process has been um, the best way that students have, have produced kind of really organized and thought out writing. So that's why I'm sharing this approach with you. So the paragraph structure is broken down here. So these are those words we've been talking about so far, claim, evidence, warrant, and extension. So a claim is also known as the topic sentence of a paragraph. It's um, the part of the paragraph, just a, a short one sentence answer to the mini question that you created. And it's developed from what you learned from in the sources. Evidence, after your claim, what you need to do logically is okay you answered a question and now you need to give some background information some some additional support to to break down that topic sentence a little more so after claim comes the evidence and it's where you put some background information needed to understand how you developed your observation or answer which was your claim and then you point directly to something that someone else wrote to support or back up your claim this establishes your authority as a trustworthy writer and thinker. So it's not enough for me to say that um, Abraham Lincoln was, um, was one of the greatest presidents. Let's say that that's my claim. Abraham Lincoln was a, the, one of the greatest presidents because he was able to um, keep the union together. Okay, maybe that's my claim. It's not enough for me to say that and just take my opinion for it, right? Because the claim is just really your opinion and it's your observation based on things you read. I can support that further by pointing to some evidence. So that's why this is important. It's not just what I think. I need to point to something some other people said who have a little bit more authority than I do. I'm just writing an essay, right? I'm just a student writing an essay. I need to point to some professionals who really study the topic and share what they said because that then backs me up. It's kind of like saying like, hey, don't take my word for it. Look, this person said it and she said it and this one said it and this famous author who studied this topic extensively also said it. And that's exactly what your evidence is doing. It's just further supporting your observation and it's showing where you got that from. A warrant is your analysis of the evidence. It's your explanation, your rationale, your reasoning, and a full explanation of the claim. So the claim is just a quick one sentence starter, right? It's topic sentence. It's just getting you started. It hasn't really answered the question yet. And your evidence, that's not really your words. That's you pointing to other people, other people's words. The warrant, this is your part. This is where you're showing everyone that you studied this too and you read about it and you've learned and you have ideas and you have important things to say and this is where you explain all of that in that analysis part the warrant section and you give a full a full detailed rationale and then reasoning and explanation of your topic sentence and the claim it was what it is that you are trying to and then the last part is called the extension. And this is where you kind of close out the idea from this paragraph and you um, begin to bridge it into the next one. So on your outline, again, this is why that outline is so important, you'll know what your next topic might be. So you'll have in your mind, okay, well, then after I talk about this, after I talk about um, Abraham Lincoln's uh, accomplishments as a young uh, adult, right? I'm, I'm going to be talking about how he entered into politics. So I know my next idea is about politics and I want to give the reader a bridge so that the reader can understand that the next, this part connects to my next part. So your extension would have 
a connection to what it is your next area it is. It's a, it's almost a transition. So if I, again, sticking with the Abraham Lincoln idea, um, after I talk about, you know, how, how accomplished he was and driven and his personality, maybe I talk about his personality in adolescence, then I might extend it by saying, um, while he was his, or Abraham Lincoln's drive and passion and work ethic, carried over with him into adulthood as he began to enter into the political world. And that would be my extension because guess what? My next paragraph is going to be all about how he entered politics and why he did it. So that closes out this paragraph and then it enters and it kind of gets your toes wet into the next one. Now, while this is how this is the, the formula for, or this is kind of what your end result looks like, of the paragraph. Your claim comes first, your evidence is second, the warrant is third, the extension is fourth. Okay, this is the pattern. Claim, evidence, warrant, extension. This is how it should look for your reader in order for them to make sense. It logically progresses from one to the next to the next to the next. However, even though this is what your final paragraph looks like, it's not the order that you want to work on each part. You don't want to do the claim first, evidence second. Okay, that's not how you want to do it. You need to do this one first. You need to do your evidence first. And the reason why is because your claim should connect to the evidence. If you haven't yet picked evidence, it's really hard to make that claim connect to it. So by using your evidence first, then you explain it, then you'll have a claim that really summarizes and captures what it is you really observed about this topic, because that's what the claim is. It's your answer. Well, to get your answer, you have to study the reading and come up with an answer first. So you have to do the evidence warrant and then your claim. And this is where a lot of students kind of fall. They usually come up with a topic sentence and then they say, okay, here's my topic sentence. This is what I'm gonna write about in this paragraph. And then they say, now I need to go find some articles that support my idea. Okay, that's backwards, okay? You're gonna find yourself scrambling trying to find evidence or articles or sources or anything or, or parts of books that you you know you're you're hunting for something you came up with something in your head now you're hunting for evidence to prove it that's not how evidence works it's not how it works in the real world either right you don't say um he's guilty of something and then go digging around looking for a reason to find guilt right you notice the evidence first and then you develop your observation, right? Um, you know, you find up oh, text messages from that that girl. Oh no, he's he's been cheating. I have the evidence. He's talking. You know, he's he's being unfaithful. I have the evidence right in front of me. And now my claim is he's cheating. That's my observation. But again, you use the evidence first. You use the evidence first to develop the claim. Remember this. Stick it in your head. Okay. So. First, go back to the source that connects to the question. Remember, your mini question was developed from a specific source that you read. So that's helping you now because now you know where you need to go because you created the question based on something that you already read. So you already kind of created a topic that connects to evidence. So you go back to the source that connects to the specific question. Then you kind of skim through that source until you find the part of text that best responds to the mini question. Then what you do is you select um, a piece of the text and then you quote and cite it, okay? After you do that, because all of this information is fresh in your head, that's when you wanna write your analysis. That's when you want to do your warrant because you have that source in front of you, you picked your evidence, and now it's all fresh in your minds to get all your thoughts out about it. You, you explain it, you summarize it a little bit, right? You get it all your ideas out right off the bat. 
So then you have your evidence and then you have your warrant. Those are the two bulkiest parts of the paragraph. So get them out of the way. After you do these two things, then you create your claim because your claim is going to connect directly to these things. So you are going to take what the evidence said and what you thought about it to create a one sentence almost summary, right? That is an answer to that mini question and puts that, that question into a statement. And then again, the last thing is the extension. So this is when you take a peek at what's coming next, you figure out what's coming down on the outline, and then you transition the ideas. Okay, I'm going to <clears throat> show you here uh, an example. So the topic that I've been kind of sticking with since we started this process was uh, jealousy as a topic. So say my one of my mini questions that which I actually put this on my sample outline my mini question is why does jealousy lead to irrational behaviors and I put my source four next to that okay so that's where I I developed this question is was after I read source four so over here let's pretend that this is source four okay the evolution of psychology of envy and jealousy I found this um, after going on Wikipedia and using that reference list and this this brought me to this and then I found a little bit of a passage here so I closely I, I skimmed through this source and I narrowed in on this paragraph right here and now I want to closely read this to see what I can learn to answer this question what is the evolutionary logic that drives envy? The fact that you envy your neighbor more than Bill Gates? The answer to that, the whole purpose of envy is to motivate you into action either by independently trying harder, envy, or by coveting and stealing what other has, jealousy. This is why jealousy has an aggressive component, but envy is more positive and sometimes even being tinged with admiration. Okay, so I located my source. I skimmed through my source to find the part that best responds to the question. I reread this smaller passage, let's say read it multiple times to fully understand what it meant. And now I'm going to identify the part of the passage that directly answers the question or best answers the question. And then I'm going to quote and cite it. So after reviewing all this, I found that the best part um, that really nailed it was the whole purpose of envy is to motivate you into action either by independently trying harder or by coveting and stealing what the other has. Okay, why does jealousy lead to irrational behavior? Oh, well, envy, jealousy motivates you into action, okay? Awesome, got that. Now I have my selected quoted evidence. You'll remember from the, our paragraph structure talk, the next thing I want to do is elaborate on this. I want to put my warrants, okay, because it's all fresh in my mind. I just read it, and I can look back through the source if I need to. And I am going to now analyze this, keep my passage handy to refer back to as I need it, and I'm going to pull specific language from the quote to incorporate in my analysis. So my analysis might say, Evolutionary studies suggest that strong emotions like envy and jealousy motivate you into action. Notice I put this in quotes because this is exactly what it said here. I don't have to cite it again with like where it came from. I'm quoting it from the quote because I'm using the author's words, motivate you into action right there. So evolutionary studies suggest that strong emotions like envy and jealousy motivate you into action, which may explain why humans who act on their jealous emotions do so without fully thinking. While some instances of envy can inspire individuals to try harder, others might be driven to more aggress aggressive measures like coveting and stealing. In both cases, motivation to act is strong and can lead individuals to behaving in irrational ways. Okay, so I took this quote, I, I reread it a few times so that I really got a good understanding. And then I answered that question, why does jealousy lead to rational behaviors? I, well, I learned that jealousy is such a strong emotion and specifically jealousy, it, it, it motivates you to act. And when you are jealous of something, it can have a, an aggressive side to it. So you might do something irrational like steal something from somebody because you are jealous of them. 
And I answered that question right there because that, that emotion is so strong. Now I have my evidence. I have my warrant. I need to develop my claim. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this. And I'm going to answer this question here. I'm going to look back over at this question. Why does jealousy lead to rational behaviors? And now I'm going to create a claim. Jealousy is a strong emotion that has the power to drive us to act in irrational ways. Perfect. That's all you need to do. Okay. It's a, it's an observation. It's a claim. It's a topic sentence that I created based on what I read. I did this first, created this last. Now between your claim and your evidence, don't forget, you have to put some background information here. You need to lead these two into one another and you need to maybe include some more things that will provide context for your evidence. Otherwise we call this a, a hanging quote if you just kind of like slap the quote in there without anything that comes before it. So don't forget within your evidence you have to introduce it properly, put it into context and provide any kind of background and information that your reader might need to make sense of the evidence. All right, so right, 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 right. Okay, when you're on your draft, just get your ideas down. Don't sweat the other stuff just yet. Don't worry about your grammar and, and the, the word counts and all of those things. Okay, just get all of your ideas on that topic and on those mini questions down. Okay, your, again, your first draft is should be longer than what you're going to end up with. So just get everything out. Aim to write maybe like 10 sentences for each mini question that you have. Um, again, if you haven't yet realized, having your sources, summaries, notes, and outline completed is a huge time saver right about now. You took something like a big task, like answer, uh, this is a huge, write an essay to answer this topic question, right? Huge, huge step. And you broke it down into smaller and more manageable steps, which is going to speed up the process, right? So just like if you can, um, if you have like a really messy room and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't, this room is a mess. I have to clean the whole room and it's a disaster. You break it into smaller parts, right? Maybe I will um, make my bed first and then I'll do my laundry and then I'll vacuum the floor and then I'll dust the furniture, right? Breaking it down into smaller steps is actually a way to save time. And that's what you've done up until this point. Students who don't follow the writing process, okay, always have the big task on their plate. They always are daunted by the fact that they have an essay to write and they haven't done anything to break it down. Typically, they become super overwhelmed and just rush to write something down in the end. And then they turn in like a big jumbled garbage piece that reflects that they didn't really put much effort into it. Um, I don't know how many times I'll, I have students come to me literally like the day before an essay is due and then say, oh, Miss Leary, I need help. I have an essay to turn in tomorrow. Okay, well, when did you know you had to write this essay? Ah, a few weeks now. Okay, that's a problem. And then we sit down to work together to get through it and they haven't done any reading on it. They haven't even cracked open a book or, or even Googled the topic. And there's no way that you can write if you haven't researched or studied or read about the topic, if you haven't thought about some questions that you're seeking to answer. There's just It's just not a possibility. Anything that you write, if you don't follow the writing process, is going to just come out jumbled and uh, poor quality for sure. And teachers definitely hate when students do this and, and just skip the process because now a teacher has to take time to read and grade that pile of jumbled garbage that the student turned in. And as they're reading and grading it, they know that this isn't a real reflection of what the student is able to do. They know that the student is a smart student. They know that the student has some really great ideas and is clever and is good with their words and is always raising their hand in class to share verbally. Um, so they know that they have all the skills able to do it, but they just didn't put it down into writing. And it, it's really frustrating for a teacher because again, that takes time and we, we, as teachers, we have a lot of essays to read and grade and we want to give meaningful feedback to students that is going to help them grow and learn. And if you're not taking the time to really go through the process and improve, then their feedback is just kind of meaningless. And it's a disrespectful thing to your teacher to not really take time with your essays 
And it's a disrespect to um, themselves too, because they missed an opportunity that was going to let them learn and practice and grow. And again, we talked about how important writing is in the real world, how your words are powerful. And it's something that you should choose very carefully and not ever rush and just put any old thing down. Okay. So there is no shortcut in the writing process. There really isn't. Each step builds upon an X, but I will tell you this, the more you go through the writing process and do it the right way, the more automated it becomes. And you start doing this process without even having to consciously think about it. And that is when you get super fast. You do it the right way and you get faster at it. All right, your homework. You are going to turn your outline, your questions into a draft. Now, I know I gave you 10 points. I wanted you to do a 10 point outline. However, you are going to only select four of your mini questions, only four. So even though you have a full 10 point outline, only pick four of your best mini questions, the mini questions that you think you can answer with your sources. Five mini questions for the honor students. For each of your selected mini questions, you're going to write a full paragraph following the claim evidence warrant extension model that we reviewed today. So you're going to pick your four mini questions. You are going to write paragraphs on them using claim evidence and warrant, and you're going to make sure you reference your sources so that you can use the evidence to develop those claims. On Monday, we are going to review the drafts and talk about intro and conclusion paragraphs and thesis statements. So don't worry about any of that part yet. Just those four mini question paragraphs. Again, if you have any questions at all, always email me or you can put them right into the parking lot and I will get back to you. Good luck. I can't wait to read what you put down.